Hey there, everybody. This is Corey Huff with The Abundant Artist, and it is a beautiful, soggy morning on the West Coast in Portland, Oregon. Uh, but we love the drizzly wet weather, and uh, that's why I moved here to the Pacific Northwest. If you are watching this on uh, my YouTube channel or the Google Plus Hangout or on theabundantartist.com slash hangouts, uh, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Uh, we invited everybody uh, to these this series of hangouts to talk about how to sell your art before you're actually done creating your art. Um, I had this interesting conversation with uh, an artist last week who was talking about a new series that she was working on, but uh, she didn't know how to sell it. She didn't. Know, she was afraid that if she took the time it took to make it, that she wouldn't be able to make any money uh, during during the creation process. And so I just said, well, why don't you just sell it before you're you're done making it? And uh, she looked at me like I had grown an extra head and had no idea what I was talking about. And I realized that um, that's probably true for a lot of artists. There are probably a lot of artists who uh, don't know how to sell their art while it's in process. So I thought we would have this little hangout uh, with the, that people can watch uh, to talk about that very idea. Um, so while we are uh, talking, feel free to uh, you know leave comments in the comments section on YouTube or to leave comments uh, on, on theabundantartist.com slash hangouts, and I will definitely be uh, checking, uh, I will definitely be checking the comments section, uh, and if people want to join me live, um, you know, feel free to, to pop on over. Um, I sent out some invites to those who, who wanted to join. Uh, if you are trying to, if you are desperately trying to figure out how to join, uh, the Hangout with me live here, uh, there, you can leave a comment with your email address, and it should be your Google Plus profile email address. Um, and then I can add you uh, as a user to this Hangout. Uh, you'll just have to be patient with me while I uh, look through those comments and, and get people up and running. Um, so we've got a couple people who are trying to join now, and I'm just going to add them real quick. And they should be able to be in here uh, here in just a moment. And I am watching the comments on YouTube and on the site. Um, feel free to leave any questions you, that you might have. Okay. So this idea of selling art before it's sold, um, it's, a, it's a really attractive idea, and the, the basic idea is not very complicated. Um, this is something that artists have been doing for a long time. Uh, so essentially, if you, have, if you know a few collectors or people that are interested in, in, your, in your work, you uh, can sort of talk to them about uh, your ideas, talk to them about this, the, you know, the series you want to create or this painting idea you have, and if they're interested, if they express enthusiasm for it, then just make sure you keep them in the loop as you're working on it. Maybe send them a couple of photos, uh, send them um, some sketches, uh, send them uh, you know as you're working on layers. Those are all these are all different ways that you can do that. And uh, artists have been doing that for a long time, inviting people into the studio, letting them take a look at work in progress, um, talking to them about it. The only difference uh, is that now you have the internet, and you can do that with the whole world. Um, and, and it's much easier to get the word out about your art. Um, the, the only difference is you're now you're competing with all kinds of other people. The really interesting thing to me is that uh, there are not a lot of artists doing this. A lot of artists simply hold, hold themselves up in their studio, and they don't talk to anybody until their art is done. And then uh, when it's done, they, they sort of emerge from their cocoon and then and, and try and then they have they're under all this pressure to go oh my gosh hey everybody here's my art and and you, you sort of put yourself in a situation where you've created all this stuff but you have no idea whether or not anybody is is interested in it or not and there's there's definitely a way to make make that less pressure for yourself so just checking comments real quick um, there's a couple people trying to get in. If you do not have a Google Plus profile, you can't participate in Hangouts. 
So you'll need to get a Google Plus profile and submit your email address uh, that way. Adding a couple more people that want to join us. Alrighty. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to do today was to share with you, um, I, I have this course that I've done uh, a couple of times with artists all around the world, and the course is called Content Marketing for Artists, and, and basically it goes into exactly what we're talking about here, about selling your art before it's ever been, uh, cre before it's, you're done creating it. And so I'm going to hit my screen share here, and I'm going to share with you a little bit from this course, not the whole thing, because we don't have time for that, but I'm going to share a little bit with you and show you what I'm talking about. So what is content marketing? Um, just going into the history of content marketing a little bit. Uh, so if we start talking about like big companies that have done content marketing, uh, you get Jell-O. Now Jell-O, uh, when they first came out, you know, it was just gelatin. It's just a branded form of gelatin. Gelatin had been around for a long time. It was very common. Um, but Jell-O wanted to stand out and differentiate itself from the crowd. So uh, they created this cookbook that had all kinds of recipes for that included gelatin. And of course, uh, since Jell-O's brand was all over it, if you were going to use those recipes, you were probably going to buy Jell-O. Uh, tremendously successful for them. It's just a way of not only selling the product, but also giving people added value, giving people a story, meaning I, I'm, I can create this recipe um, and, and use the product while I'm creating that recipe, and then share that product with, uh, share that finished recipe with their family and friends. Tremendously successful marketing campaign for Jell-O. Um, G.I. Joe, same thing. When G.I. Joe came out, they were plastic figurines. Um, there were already la lots of plastic army men and plastic figurines on the market. So G.I. Joe uh, came up with a comic book um, that uh, told the story of the individual uh, characters, those individual pl plastic figurines. Um, and then the comic book, of course, became a TV show and became movies. And this is tremendously successful for uh, G.I. Joe uh, to, you know, as a way to sell toys. Um, Nike Plus and Apple uh, did this as well. So there, when Nike Plus uh, came out, uh, excuse me, when, when, app, when the iPod came out, there were already lots of MP3 players on the market. Um, when Nike, Nike wants to sell you shoes and athletic wear. Uh, Nike uh, came up with this brilliant idea of helping you track your exercise activity, your running, your weightlifting, all that kind of stuff. So they integrated that into the iPod and created this thing that uh, gives you a story to tell about how much exercise you've done, how much weight you've lost, um, and how your body has changed in that time. Uh, the Will It Blend videos, super fun. Um, these guys are selling blenders. Blenders are, in my opinion, maybe one of the most boring products ever. But uh, when Blendtec, based in Utah, uh, decided to start uh, showing off how powerful their blenders were, instead of blending fruit, they started blending everyday objects. And things really sort of hit its peak when Blendtec decided to blend an iPad. Um, and that was, that was a huge deal for them. And uh, this video went viral and got millions and millions of views. Um, you know, it was a $600 iPad. But for the, the number of views that they got for that $600 iPad, uh, very, very much worth it. Uh, it sounds like we have uh, people joining us on the Hangout. Is that right? Hey there, Cher. Hi, Corey. How's it going? Hey, it's going great. Good to see you here. Nice to see you. Thank you for doing this. You bet. What part of the country are you in? I'm in California, San Francisco Bay Area. San Francisco Bay Area. We're in the same time zone. I'm in Portland, Oregon. Nice. Yeah. So thank you so much for joining. Um, Cher, I'd love to hear from you about your experience with selling your art before it's it's done. Have you ever done anything like that? We haven't sold any of our art yet. Oh, okay. You still are you are you just getting started in the in the art marketing world? Well, yeah, we are. We're ready. We've amassed a large body of work. My husband and I paint together on the same canvas at the same time. Mm -hmm. We do really large works of art, very contemporary. Can you see that one in the background? Mm -hmm. Yep. So, 
a um, lot of bright colors, and since we paint at the same time, anybody can do anything to the painting, and then we both agree when it's finished, when we're done. Nice. That's kind of, uh, that's it's kind of, of cool. an expressive arts process, and it's right. grown into a massive body of work. Wow. So you guys have a bunch of paintings, and you're trying to figure out how to sell them? Yes. Very cool. Well, I, I certainly wish you the best of luck with that. It's, uh, it, 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 there's a lot to learn as, a, as an artist business person. Yeah, we just got our website up. We were having a lot of issues, so we went with the Wix website because I was interested in joining your mentoring program, but we didn't even have our website up yet. So right, right. One of those types of challenges that I don't want to get hung up in and do some things that are gonna, you know, be good. And I've been following you for a while, so cool. Hi, Michelle. Hello. So you don't have your webcam on, but we can hear you. Okay, great. Glad you're here. Thank and you. Michelle, what part of the world are you in? I'm in Spanish Fort, Alabama. Spanish Fort, Alabama. It's near Mobile. And where are you two? Uh, we're, I'm in Portland, and uh, Cher is in uh, San Francisco. Okay. Yeah. And uh, are you Corey by any chance? I, I am Corey. Oh, yeah. I wasn't sure. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So we're just, um, I was just sharing uh, with everybody a little bit about uh, sort of the history behind the idea of content marketing. Um, the idea of how do you take the message that you have, whether it's your art or, you know, your blender product or some other thing, how do you create an interesting enough story that people want to uh, learn more about it and spend more time uh, doing that? Okay. So um, I'm going to jump back into uh, that, and if you all have questions, feel free to jump in and let me know. Okay. Okay. Uh, so back to the screen share. Here we go. So talking about the blend tech videos, so so content marketing is really making what you do as an artist or a product developer interesting in other contexts. Uh, one of my favorite bloggers, his name is Mark McGinnis, he runs a blog called Lateral Action. Um, he says that what people are looking for online is original and remarkable media content. So the less your stuff looks like advertising, the more effective it will be at advertising. Um, so, you know, if you can do something like the Blendtec videos, you know, that's an ad, but really it's, it's people uh, watching people do insane things like blending an iPad. Um, pretty fun stuff. So I want to share with you uh, the, this video by my friend Gwen Seymour, who is an artist based here in Portland, Oregon, and she does some interesting things with video. We're going to jump in and take a look at this. And I think you'll find this pretty entertaining. I have never shaved my legs. I think I wanted to once when I was maybe 11 or 12, and my mother informed me that I was too young to shave my legs. By the time she felt like it was more appropriate, I had grown out of the idea that I wanted to shave my legs. I don't, I don't shave my legs for three reasons. For one thing, my leg hair is light. If it were darker, I think I would probably be tempted to shave it. For another, it's a really good way of identifying morons, and morons, I mean by that, uh, people who make certain life choices and then believe that everyone else should make the same life choices. So what the heck's going on here? Why is, why is Gwen talking about shaving her legs, right? This is the, the, the first question that everybody always asks me, um, but I think that it's actually really brilliant. Uh, because what she's doing is, and you'll see this here in a minute, Gwen is actually connecting uh, the idea that she doesn't shave her legs to her art and why she creates her art. Um, so this is pretty interesting. Turn, uh, keep watching. Come on. <laughs> Yay, technology. Well, here in a minute it'll work, I imagine. We'll give a serious yay for technology. Isn't this wonderful that we can hang out and do this? <laughs> yeah, this is pretty cool. I'm just, uh, 
That's too bad. All right, well, I guess we won't be watching the rest of Gwen's video. I've seen some of hers that you sent out before mm -hmm. and about mm -hmm. the personal story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, the whole idea, Gwen goes on to talk about, in, in the video, she goes on to talk about uh, a little more about why she doesn't shave her legs, and basically it's, you know, there are certain societal expectations around leg shaving, and um, she can sort of filter out the people that she enjoys interacting with uh, based on that. And um, Gwen deals with, uh, herself deals with some uh, particular female issues. She has endometriosis, um, and uh, that made her interested in uh, society's expectations on different genders, uh, what, what ge different gender roles are. So she started doing paintings about animals who don't conform to uh, gender expectations. Uh, and, and that series is called the Crime Against Nature series. And in that series, uh, you can see uh, her talking about, um, you can see her uh, talking about, like, like, she's got a painting of uh, elk who don't have horns, male elk that don't have horns. Um, everybody thinks that male elk have horns, but not all of them do. And so, uh, and, and, and those elk, even though they don't have horns, are still uh, successful at reproducing and being elk. So, uh, you know, not every creature out there does what we think uh, it should do. And her whole uh, series of paintings has been very successful for her. She's turned it into not only the, that video, but she has a book out um, that includes her paintings. And um, in that video, she also walks people through the different layers and steps that she went through to create uh, her elk painting. And uh, you can see, like, the progress of the painting as it goes along. Um, and I think that's a very effective way for artists to market themselves. Um, <clears throat> the idea being that you can tell a story about your art and tell a story about, um, you know, why you create and who you are as an artist um, along with all of those things. So what do you guys think about that? Do you have any, any questions or comments? Well, do you think that that's necessary? Well, I don't think it's necessarily necessary, but it's effective. Right. Yeah. Um, it, the, well, I think, go, go ahead, ahead Cher. No, you go, go ahead. ahead. Well, I think our story is interesting, but I'm a little bit stuck on how to tell it. And I've kind of, you know, I have like a really small, like too many paragraph bio, so it's not mm -hmm. too much. Mm -hmm. So really kind of letting the work speak for itself. I mean, our paintings end up really just being about love, so we're expressing our love through our paintings. But how to get to different markets, put a different spin on that, so it's not too mushy, mushy, mm -hmm. but yeah. still interesting, you know? Hey, Sue, how you doing? Um, so, so you said something in there, share that I think is interesting. You said we want to let the art speak for itself. Um, that's great, but the art can't actually speak. Um, and and mm -hmm. here's the interesting thing about art collectors: um, a lot of art, a lot of people who buy art don't know anything about art. Right? They don't know the, about the technique that goes into something. They don't know uh, about the background or the story. And so, the most successful art salespeople in the world know how to create a story around that art. They, and whether that is through a marketing campaign like, like Gwen's videos, or if it's uh, literally just sitting down and, and explaining the story to somebody one-on-one. -on -one. Um, how many of you know about the $12 million stuffed shark? Nope. No? Okay. Yeah. Damien yeah. Hurst. Yep. Damien yep. Hurst. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so for those of you who don't know, uh, Damien Hurst, who is a very successful living artist, um, he created this, pe this piece of art where he had a great white shark caught and, uh, and killed and stuffed in, and put in a tank of formaldehyde. Um, so it's this gigantic 12-foot shark um, in a gigantic tank of formaldehyde. And, you know, it was fairly expensive to do something like that, probably a few hundred thousand dollars. But he partnered with Larry Gagosian, uh, who is a, a very uh, successful gallery owner, to, and he ended up selling this piece for $12 million, right? And 
the the thing that I think is really interesting about that is not the art itself, but the story around how it was sold, right? Gagosian and Hearst got together and created this whole very uh, elaborate marketing campaign. They brought in individual collectors from all over the world. They flew them in and told them the whole story about what Hearst had done and why he had done it. Um, it, it wasn't simply sticking the art in a gallery somewhere and letting it speak for itself. They really made an effort to get people there and to tell them the story and help them understand and feel the story around that art. Um, and that's what I'm talking about. Is, is getting people to connect with your art and, and not simply just posting it online or posting it, uh, you know, or, or showing it in a gallery and hoping that the right person happens to come along and, and be ready to whip out their wallet. Michelle, does that sort of give you an idea on the difference between required and effective? Yeah, definitely. It, um, it makes sense that you want to get the word out mm -hmm. and I've read other other places where you want to give a story about your art because like you said collectors don't really understand especially where you're coming from and they want to know mm -hmm. uh, right now I've created a newsletter <clears throat> with one of my works in progress I'm um, wondering if that is good enough it, so the only yeah so here's the other thing interesting thing about marketing um, Good enough is whatever works, right? And and for some artists, they luck out, and they may, maybe you know early in their career they get picked up by by Saatchi, right? right? And if your art gets collected by Saatchi, pretty much everything you make from that point on is just going to sell, uh, just just kind of the way that it works. Um, but for you know all the ninety nine percent of artists who aren't collected by Saatchi. Uh, you have to do a little more work, right? And and so then it's figuring out, you know, what kind of an artist do you want to be, what kind of experience do you want to have, and what kind of experience do you want your end collector, your your collectors to have, when right? You say experience. What do you mean? Um. So what, you know, what what do you want your ideal art life to be like? You know, do you want to uh, sit in the studio and not interact with other people and just create art and not have to worry about any of that other stuff, pretty much the only way to make that happen is if you get collected by Saatchi or picked up by Gagosian or one of the other big galleries. That's the only way that's going to happen. Yeah. Um, some artists really enjoy the process of connecting with other people. There's a, a, a friend of mine named Kelly Ray Roberts. She's based here in Portland as well. Um, Kelly Ray over the last three years has sold $10 million worth of art. Uh, but she really enjoys the process of connecting with other people. She has a very prolific blog. Uh, she's been running it since 2006 or 2007. Um, and you can see the whole progress of her art and her professional career. Uh, if you go back from the beginning and read to now, you, see, you get an idea of exactly who she is. She has, you know, tons and tons of followers on her blog and her email newsletter, and she goes out of her way to connect with people on an individual level, and she enjoys that, right? Yeah. Um, so not everybody's going to do that. Now, some people don't have the the bandwidth or the uh, enough extrovertness to to do something like that. Um, so, so it's kind of a, you know, what do you want that experience to be like, and then for the collector, what do you want their experience to be like? Do you want them to feel like they're connected with you personally? Do you want uh, them to do something? You know, some artists create art because they have a specific purpose. Uh, there's an artist in Las Vegas that I work with named Taylor Nishinsky, and Taylor cares a lot about wildlife and, uh, and wildlife activism. And so her paintings, um, she partners with a wildlife conservation group and most of her paintings, that you know, a good chunk of the profits go towards that wildlife conservation group, and she, uh, you know, has a stated goal of of help saving wildlife. All right, so that's her agenda. Right, and so her collectors, for the most part, are people that also care about wildlife and nature, and care about conservation, and, and or or at least are interested enough to contribute to the cause. Okay. Yeah. 
So it's thinking a little bit more about what is your art about beyond simply creating the art. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Hi, Sue. Oh, can't hear you. Do you have your microphone turned on? Yeah, we can't hear you. You can type in the chat, but we can't hear you at all, Sue. That's too bad. So looking at other, looking at the comments. So Sheila says, I think it helps patrons if they can connect to the work on a personal level. That doesn't necessarily mean they want or need to know our life story. Something as simple as seeing the process of the individual piece in progress can give the patron a connection to that item that he or she may not have otherwise experienced. Yeah, that's a, that's a great comment, Sheila. I like that comment a lot. I'm gonna, just going to read that again. I think it helps patrons if they can connect to the work on a personal level. That doesn't necessarily mean that they want or need to know our life story. Something as simple as seeing the process of the individual piece in progress can give the patron a connection to that item that he or she may not have otherwise experienced. That's really good. Um, in the, the content marketing course uh, that I was going through earlier, uh, I teach artists to document their process. Uh, you know, as you are creating work, make sure that you take pictures of it as stages, through stages, or video yourself creating the whole piece. Um, make sure that you journal about the artistic process. Uh, you know, as you're, as you're going through the stages, you know, maybe as you're waiting for a layer to dry, write a little bit about what you're thinking about and what you're feeling as you're creating the art. Um, I think the discovery stage is, is really interesting. Maybe when you're doing sketches and doing studies and doing research for your piece, maybe you uh, take some of your research and publish some of your, your research. Those things are all very interesting. Um, as artists, we, we, start to, we, we tend to think uh, you know, the, the end result is the most interesting part, but for a lot of people, all of the work that goes into a painting is really interesting. That's why they have all those special features in movie DVDs, right? We all want to see the bloopers. We want to see the, you know, why did Vince Gilligan decide to have Walt not kill Jesse during the Breaking Bad finale? Sorry if I had just spoiled the Breaking Bad finale for anybody, but um, it, just thinking out loud about uh, those sorts of things, people really care about the process and the behind the scenes. Right. So beyond uh, taking pictures and doing video and all that kind of stuff, um, th there's also the idea of, okay, now that you have your process in place, you know, how do you make it available for people? And this goes back to what we were talking about a minute ago about what do you want the experience for your collector to be, right? And if you're selling art online, there's a couple, basically a couple different ways three or four different ways that people can buy art online. There's pure e-commerce where people go to your website, they click a buy now button and they add something to their shopping cart and they buy it and they're done, right? Um, that works for some artists. Uh, then like there's a gallery in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona run by Jason Horas called Xanadu Gallery and when they decided to add e-commerce to their gallery's website, their first sale was an $8,500 piece of art. And, and that was somebody that they had never met, and it was some random uh, collector in Georgia who came, across their, who came across their website and was looking for something for their living room and just clicked buy and bought it, $8,500 sight unseen. Uh, so, you know, obviously not, every, not, not everyone's going to have a story like that, but... The opportunity, if you don't have e-commerce on your site, that opportunity will never be there. Um, my, my good friend Melissa Dinwiddie does the same thing. She does, um, you know, she does original ketuba, which are basically painted wedding contracts for Jewish people. And uh, she has print versions of those on her website. The, uh, they're very high quality prints uh, that she sells on her website. Um, and she doesn't have to interact with the person at all. She, they, they, you know, somebody can go there, click buy, and then she goes and fulfills the order and sends it off to them. Um, 
you know, that's a, a very effective thing for, for artists and makes, you know, the, the transaction process a lot easier. Um, the other way that people buy art online is through commissions. Uh, people might look through your portfolio online and decide that, you know, they don't want to buy that exact thing, but maybe they want to uh, buy a commission from you, right? Um, and so on your website, you know, is there a clear process for how to create commissions? Uh, Anray.com, A-N-N-R-E-A. Uh, Anray.com does a great job of showing people what the commission process is like. There's a big video where she um, talks about her artistic process and what she does on commissions. Um, and then down below the video, there's uh, a bunch of text that spells out exactly how um, or what you should expect, rather, when you purchase a commission from her. Um, so, I, you know, if you don't have a section on your website that does that, I'd highly recommend it. Um, other ways that people buy art online. So, obviously, you should have a high-quality portfolio on your website um, because galleries and collectors um, and, and uh, auction auctioneers, they're going to look at your website and they're going to want to know what kind of art you have. So, do you have a a good um, portfolio on your on your website. So Sue, uh, you said what was that website? It was anrea.com, A-N-N-R-E-A.com. I think that was the one you're looking for. Any questions about any of that? Do you have any recommendations about how the portfolio should look, how much you should have in there, what's too much, and or is I that have, just an individual consultation with you? I have all kinds of opinions about that. <laughs> Great. I want to I hear have one it. more question, too. Can I give two at once? Uh, sure. My other one's like, what about, I have some small pieces that we've created Mm -hmm. Like 16 by 12 or something like that that I was wondering about putting on SD or something for exposure. And I was wondering, mm -hmm. is that good or bad for your career? Like, what would that Yeah, that's a great question. Okay, so that's two different questions. Those are two different questions. So, um, basically, well, let me start here. Um, let's start with the portfolio piece first. So, one of the biggest problems that I see artists having is your your online gallery the thumbnails are too small right um, I think if you have you know it, it's one thing to have the gallery page where maybe you've got nine or twelve images on the page and it's it's a little gallery I think um, you know at the very least those those should be you know two three hundred pixels wide um, so that people can can at least get an idea of what the thumbnail is um, but then you should also be able to click on that image and open up another page that has a larger version of that image on the page that's, you know, five to 900 pixels wide so you can see full detail. Um, that doesn't mean uploading a high-resolution version of the image. Um, you know, if you keep the, the DPI for the image at 72, um, you know, it's a technical term that basically means how many pixels are in the, uh, in the image. You want to keep that fairly low so that people can't print it off and pass the art off as their own. But um, if you keep the DPI low, you can put a large image on your website um, and give people an idea so they can see detail um, of your art. Um, and I do think it's important for uh, that art to have for each art piece of art to have its own individual page so that you can put a description below it um, or next to it and maybe a buy now button. Um, I think that's the where a lot of artists um, struggle is, uh, you know, if you want to get found on search engines and get passed around via social media, your individual pieces of art need to have their own page, their own URL that people can share. Um, and, and so if you click on, if you're on the gallery page and you click on it and you get like that light box effect, that pop-up effect, um, and then you can click an arrow and scroll through those real quick, that's great but that's not an individual page that a, a person can grab and share. Um, so I, at the very least, you should have both, um, and, and I think that you, each piece of art should have its own, its own page. So hopefully, I've answer, uh, hopefully that's all clear. Um, 
by the way, in the in the content marketing course, I go through all of this in great detail, and there's recorded videos of it, and you can download those and all that stuff. Um, so the other question was, I'm sorry, what was the other question? The other question, Corey, was like m selling smaller paintings on something like Esty or something. I don't oh, know if sure. collectors um, or anything go and look for things like that on Esty or other type of sites. Yeah. Um, like, yeah, that's, really good. <clears throat> yeah, I think that's perfectly fine. I think uh, the idea is... Um, I don't so really want it to look like a craft. I want it to look more of a fine art. So I guess sure. that's where my concern lies. Because I wouldn't sure. want it, I wouldn't feel like I would be in a craft show. Sure, sure. Um, there are painters on Etsy, and there are some painters who, who sell some stuff. Um, I think the idea, that ideally, your website is sort of the center of your marketing world. Okay. And it's the, it's the primary way that everybody interacts with you. That said, there's a large audience on Etsy, there's a large audience on Fine Art America, Art Fire, and all the other art websites. Um, so I think having an outpost there, uh, like a small collection there, maybe you have you know, five, six prints on each of those websites um, as a way of being found on that website and letting people know who you are. You know, and then make sure in the descriptions that you mention your website and mention who you are so that people can you know, go to your website and see more. Um, so the idea is using it as an outpost to get people back to your website. Um, you know, really, the only interactions that, the, the primary interactions that you want, not the only, the primary interactions that you want is you want something to buy from you and, and you want somebody to buy from you and you want somebody to sign up to be contacted by you again. Usually that's gonna be your mailing list, right? So if you, those small pieces are out there spreading the word about who you are and what you do, uh, it'll help a lot uh, if you can uh, get out there in all those different outposts. Okay. Hopefully that helps. Can I answer your question? You sure did. Thank you very yeah. much. You bet. I don't want to hog all this, so if somebody else has a question, take them before me. My other question is about art consultants and getting to that, making a professional type presentation to them. Mm -hmm. You know, something that's going to be because you know I would I personally we have we work very big, mm -hmm. so we work big, and I would like to see some of our art in corporate collections. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how available that market is, or doing the right type of things. You know. Yep. To try to find a good fit. Uh, yeah, uh, you know the the commercial market the, is not something that I am super familiar with. Um, you know, I know I know the basics, uh, and and essentially what I would recommend to you is, uh, you know, look up all of the art consultants that you that in your area. You said you're in San Francisco, right? There's several yeah. art agents yeah. there. Um, you should be able to look up look them up, uh, get their contact information. Do a little research before you reach out to any of them. Um, see, you know, if they list clients on their website, reach out to those artists and ask those artists what their experience was like. Okay. Um, and and more, you know, obviously it's important that the consultant uh, knows what they're doing and that they have the right connections to help you get somewhere. But uh, even more important than that is is are they trustworthy? Uh, do they treat artists well and uh, are you a good personality fit, right? Somebody can be a great consultant, but if, if you clash and that person doesn't like working with you, then neither of you are going to benefit from that situation. Right. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Sure. So really what I'm hoping... Um, hoping people get from this hangout and this conversation is that it's possible to, you know, it's possible to sell your art before you've created it, but just planning the idea of storytelling and turning your art into uh, marketing material for you is not that difficult, right? Um, <laughs> Sheila says, I have sold more work via works in progress posted on Facebook than on my personal portfolio on my website. That's good. She says these works in progress are usually samples of sample works of art that she does on commission. Um, I always include a link to my portfolio uh, in the post 
so that fans can see the final outcome of a piece. I work in multiple styles and include classical and conceptual options for the final product. This seems to appeal to a broader audience than doing just one style. Yeah. And she's doubled her studio income uh, since 2012. That's pretty great. Nice job, Sheila. She also says, Sheila also says, Sheila, you're, you're a great contributor to this conversation. She says, I use my website, Pinterest, Facebook, uh, Art Rising, etc., to sell gifts and novelties and small pieces modeled for my original Fine Art America Fine Art pieces. That, inc that, that increases traffic for the originals. Yeah, that's a great strategy, Sheila. Can you repeat that, Corey? Sorry. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, so basically what she's saying is uh, she uses uh, the website. She, uh, you, so so it's, it's sort of where it sort of looks like this. Um, you have a website, and you ha and on your website you've got your portfolio of original pieces, right? And maybe you sell those original pieces for I don't know what she sells them for, but uh, maybe it's five, ten grand, whatever. The average person uh, can't afford that uh, right now, right? Um, and even if they can afford it, they may not know your work well enough to spend that kind of money right now. But a lot of people will. Um, a lot of people will spend a smaller amount of money on, a, on an impulse buy. Uh, maybe it's a, a smaller print for 100 bucks or 200 bucks. Uh, maybe it is uh, a calendar, um, some other kind of novelty gift um, that, all, that are all modeled after your original pieces. Maybe they just have your piece, your, your art on it, or maybe it's done in the style of your art or a, a slight variation of your art, that kind of stuff. Um, those are a great way to get people in the door and buying something from you. And then they have your art in their hands and in their home. And then when they're in a position to make a larger purchase, they're going to be thinking of you. Right. Now, do you recommend having stuff like that on your website? Or, as you said previously, um, different places like Etsy or... Mm -hmm. um, again, it goes back to what you want the experience to be. Um, if your goal is really to pursue the high-end galleries and uh, be a part of that world, uh, you probably don't want those novelty items on your website. Right. Uh, <clears throat> but, I, I, you know, again, I'll say getting into one of those high-end galleries is sort of like making the NBA for an athlete. Right. Um, and And... They're not necessary. It, it, it doesn't mean it can't happen. It can, and it does. But there are more and more artists choosing to go the independent route because then you get to control your time, you control your experience, and you can still make good money. Yep. That uh, that said, do you think it's important to be represented by galleries? It it just depends on what your goals are. Um, you know, if 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 you get a gallery that is, you know, it has a proven track record of selling art for hundreds of thousands of dollars, I think it'd be pretty tough to turn that down and you'd have to have a pretty specific reason. Mm -hmm. um, that said, you can make a living without a gallery and there are tons of artists that are doing it. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think it's, uh, the gallery world is changing and because artists have the ability to connect with collectors directly, galleries have to bring some other value to the table, right? They can't, they can't just hold artists hostage or, you know, be the gatekeeper because there are so many artists out there that a collector who wants something can just go find something that they, that they want. Right. The first gallery that I went to, I just was so thrilled to be part of it, and then I realized these people aren't doing any work. They let their domain expire for their website, I don't mm -hmm. think they did the client list stuff, you know, marketing and all that, so I just pulled out. Mm -hmm. Yep. Sue says, is there a good way to tie MailChimp and Facebook together? I have a hard enough time getting one or the other done without trying to do both. Do you suggest more Facebook or email list for work in progress? Sorry about the microphone. Okay. Um, so the question is, do I do Facebook or do I do my email newsletter? Um, and is there a way to do them together? So, yes. Um, but before I answer that question, let me back up and talk a little bit about time management. Um, 
you know, I don't know how much time you spend on the business side versus, you know, creating and, and painting. Um, but my experience has been the artists that I've worked with who are financially successful with their art, um, their time split between creating and working on the business is probably about 50-50. Um, the, you know, and sometimes 60-40 in favor of the business. Uh, it just depends on, it just depends. Um, and that is going to be true as long as you are an independent artist until you get to the point where maybe you're selling art for hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. Uh, that's just kind of the way that it works. Because, um, you, you know, you have to talk to people, you have to uh, negotiate prices, you have to do shipping, you have to... Um, you know, promote your work, all that kind of stuff. And to do that effectively, you have to invest substantial amounts of time, which means you're going to create a little bit less, and that's just sort of the reality of it. Um, you know, it's, it varies a little bit for each artist, but, uh, you know, if you're, if you're not selling anything, um, but you have tons of painting, you have tons of paintings done, I would say probably start spending a lot more of your time on the business side and creating a little bit less. And I know that a lot of artists hate hearing that, but think of it as temporary. And once you get all that stuff sold and moved out, out of your house, uh, then you can go back to creating more. So uh, to answer your question, Sue, um, uh, yes, you can do them together. Facebook or MailChimp does have a post to Facebook functionality. Um, MailChimp has great customer service support. Uh, they can show you how to do it. Uh, so you can do that. Uh, the way that I tend to, I, I think your mailing list is more important than your Facebook list. Uh, people are more likely to buy something from your mailing list than, than they are from social media. Um, now, that said, it's a little different for each person. Uh, you know, Sheila mentions in the comments that, uh, that she sells quite a bit of work from her Facebook page, and that's great. Um, that works for some people, and they've, you know, they've put a lot of effort into developing their Facebook page. Um, my only concern there is that you don't control your Facebook page. Uh, Facebook, for whatever reason, can decide that you go away at any time, um, and, and they've done that to any number of my friends. Uh, they've shut down their Facebook pages. Uh, you know, all it takes is a couple people complaining about your art and and Facebook will shut you down and you pretty much have no recourse. Um, not to be all alarmist, Facebook is, is an awesome marketing tool for 90% of the artists out there. It's just be aware that you don't have control of it. So getting people on your mailing list gives you the ability to contact those people where even if MailChimp or whatever mailing service you're using shuts down, uh, you can... Uh, you can just export that list into another mailing list platform and, and still be in, 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 in okay shape. Okay. Uh, looking at comments again. Nice. So Sheila also says she also uses uh, Bill Me Later, which is a PayPal feature. Um, so basically on her website, people can sign up to buy something. Um, PayPal's Bill Me Later feature basically sets, the, sets them up on a payment plan. Um, and it pays Sheila the full amount of the purchase, and the, the client pays Bill Me Later in, in installments. So that's, that's pretty great. That's actually, I actually have never used Bill Me Later before, so good find, Sheila. So uh, that's, I mean, that's most of what I wanted to cover today. We, we kind of got deep into the weeds on, on tactics a little bit, but, um, you know, I hope uh, everybody watching this gets an idea of sort of what's possible out there. Um, if you are interested, uh, for those who are watching, whoops, there goes my headset. Um, I am doing a, uh, a series of coaching events like this uh, from now through November, 9th, November 20th uh, for people who purchase the content marketing course. Uh, I'm going to be doing a, a live coaching session each week. So as you go through the course, you can watch one video the first week and uh, do all of the homework that's in the video. 
And then uh, the next week we'll have a, a live coaching course like this so I can ask answer questions and everybody else that's there can uh, ask each other questions and collaborate and come up with ideas. Um, we also have a private Facebook group for people who are part of that course. Um, so if anybody is interested in joining that course uh, when we start uh, next week, then uh, you can go to theabundantartist.com slash content uh, and sign up for the course there. Um, I'd love to see you there. Um, it, w it should be a lot of fun. We're going to do stuff like this uh, every week, twice a week, actually. Um, there will be a morning and an afternoon session uh, each week uh, for people to get direct feedback. Corey, on the content marketing course, does that include sort of a website review for the people, or do you have a whole bunch of people in there? Is it a small group? or? Um, it's, it's generally a small group. I, I haven't had any problems with too many people signing up for it. Um, the first time that I did it, we had 30 people, and it was totally manageable. Um, and yes, we do, we do website reviews. Um, in addition to the group stuff that we do, um, everybody gets a, a free half-hour session. Okay. Um, so if I, if I were to go to the, the page right now, theabundantartist.com slash content, um, it goes into everything that's included in the course. Um, you know, I tell a little story about, about all of it, but then included in the course is, you know, we talk about automating your marketing. So things like what you were talking about, Sue, about Facebook being, you know, having to manage Facebook and MailChimp and all kinds of other stuff. We talk about how to automate some of that stuff. Um, we, we take a look at websites and what makes a quality website. Uh, there's some downloadable worksheets in the course uh, that you can use to do some research and some planning for your website. Uh, we talk about how to get people talking about your art and how to tell your story, um, how to find tar target collectors. This is a big one because you can blog and social media and newsletter to you till the cows come home, but you need to be talking to the right people. So we talk about how to find the right people. Um, and then we talk about how to grow your mailing list, how to get more people signing up for your mailing list and how to sort of automate that mailing list growth process. <clears throat> And then uh, everybody who joins the course also gets access to my other two courses, which are um, what, with the Finding Your Uniquity course, which is positioning yourself in the market, and then the Facebook course, which is an hour and a half long course on how to grow a solid Facebook uh, page. Um, we also talk about some other neat things like drafting off of popular news stories and finding out where your collectors hang out online. Um, so the full course includes, uh, there's four videos, each one's an hour long, um, where we talk about these various topics. Um, we do case studies uh, with um, real artists who've done this stuff to show their results and what they do. Um, there's the weekly conference call uh, where you can choose from a morning or an afternoon time or you can show up to both if you want. Um, and then there's transcripts of all of the videos. So if you, if you want to read along as you're, as you're listening or if you want to have you know, a quick vis uh, visual referral, um, and we have the, the private Facebook group, and then everybody who joins also gets a free 30-minute session of one-on-one -on -one help with me. Um, so that's everything that's included in the course. Uh, and again, it's theabundantartist.com slash content uh, if you want to join us, and there's some, some fun case studies on there uh, if you care to join us. So if anybody else has any questions, great. Otherwise, we'll, we'll shut it down. Thank you so much for doing this, Corey. I hope you have a beautiful day. Looking Thanks forward to more interaction. Yeah, me too. It's been fun. Thank you. Yep. So Jermaine says, oh, okay. Uh, Jermaine, I love this one. So you just spent a lot of money to participate in an art and craft show where no one sold very much. What do you think of this type of venue for sales and, and, uh, and self-promotion? So Jermaine, it is very easy. This is a very common story to spend tons of money uh, at an art and craft show and then not get very good results. So um, we could do a whole hangout, we could do a whole course on how to succeed at art shows. Um, you know, basically it, it comes down to research, making sure you're at the right uh, art fair or craft show. Um, you know, you figure out what kind of people attend and talk to other artists that have been there before and find out their success and whether or not their type of art is similar to your type of art. Um, and then there's sim simply the fact that sometimes it's not about the, the direct sale. It's about getting people's contact information and following up with them. 
Um, so it, it, it depends on the individual show and it depends on your personality and whether or not you're willing to, <clears throat> to do the, uh, the talking and the selling and the following up. Yeah. Looks like that's all the comments. Um, so thanks everybody for showing up and uh, we'll see you in the course or next time we do this. Great, thank you. Thanks everybody. Bye. Bye.